Chapter 4. Caffeine. A few key facts. Caffeine is a compound found in various plants. It can also be synthesised. It's a stimulant, globally popular and globally legal. It's consumed usually by drinking, although can be taken as a supplement in powder form. Peak effects occur around 45 minutes after consumption. Some effects of caffeine are small increases in alertness, concentration, a reduction in drowsiness and an increase in blood pressure. Yes, caffeine is a drug. Even if you've avoided every single other substance in this book, I'd be willing to bet that almost everyone, barring people with severe allergies or intolerances, has consumed a product containing caffeine at some point in their lives. Caffeine, particularly in beverages, is consumed around the globe, be it in colas, coffee, tea or mate, the national drink of Paraguay, Uruguay and Argentina. Most drinks and food products containing caffeine are not regulated. Cans of cola are consumed by children worldwide, even if they turn their noses up at more grown-up cups of tea, as I used to when I was young, eventually filling the teacup with sugar in an attempt to make it more palatable. But caffeine is a drug, a methylated xanthine to be precise, and it has a stimulant effect. There's some suggestion that it can be dependence-forming for some people, possibly more people than you might think, possibly even you listening to this, and it most certainly has withdrawal symptoms. What is it? As you probably already know, caffeine is found in coffee and tea, two of the most popular hot drinks across the world. And many people are aware that caffeine is also found in chocolate, albeit at much lower levels. There is more caffeine in dark chocolate compared to milk, and the amount is broadly similar to the higher end of levels found in decaf, tea and coffee. Some caffeine remains in these, despite their name. Caffeine occurs naturally in approximately 60 plant species, including tea leaves and coffee beans, guarana berries, used to make a number of energy drinks and snacks, cola nuts, which were once used to make cola drinks, although this is less common now, and yerba mate. I had never heard of mate until I went to Uruguay a few years ago. Montevideo was an incredible city and I really fell in love with it while I was there. But I was fascinated with a pastime that everyone, from groups of teens on the beach to retired couples taking the air, seemed to be partaking of. Almost every person we passed was carrying with them what looked to be a wooden bowl-like vessel with a metal straw sticking out of the top. If you think a nice pot of tea is an English obsession, this took it to the next level. As we walked along the beach path, every bench we passed was occupied by people enjoying the view and their mysterious drink. Luckily, I was travelling with a Syrian friend who was able to tell me all about mate. By coincidence, Syria is the largest importer of the drink. It's a hot infusion made in a way much like tea by steeping dried yerba mate leaves in near-boiling water. The calabash gourd keeps the water warm and the metal straw has a second role acting as a sieve to keep the large pieces of plant out of your mouth while you drink. The taste isn't a million miles away from a classic English breakfast tea either probably due to the tannins contained by both. It's perhaps a little more woody, certainly if there are stems included as well as the leaves in the preparation. Mate has also made it to Europe. In Germany, club mate is a fizzy drink made out of mate and is somewhat similar to cola, although containing lower sugar levels and fewer calories. As well as products that naturally contain caffeine, it's possible to manufacture caffeine as a powder, which can then be added as a supplement to drinks and food. For example, energy drinks such as Red Bull, Monster and the like contain caffeine that is added rather than naturally contained. And it's in some drinks that you might not expect. A can of Sunkist Orange contains 41 milligrams of caffeine. That's higher than a can of Coca-Cola, which contains 34 milligrams. Cola drinks are interesting in that they were initially made using cola nuts, but these days a cola is more likely to contain synthetic caffeine and not the cola nut. What's considered a dose of caffeine? A few years ago, I read a great book called Caffeinated by Murray Carpenter. In it, he suggests that around 75 milligrams of caffeine is a standard caffeine dose, or SCAD as he calls it. This is conceptually similar to a unit of alcohol, and different caffeine-containing products contain different amounts. For example, a SCAD is roughly equal to a 60 milliliter espresso or a small cup of filter coffee. Black tea contains slightly less caffeine, about 50 milligrams per cup. A can of an energy drink is roughly the same as an espresso, one scad. 
Two cans of cola are equivalent to a scad or a pint of Diet Coke. A 50 gram bar of plain chocolate contains on average 25 milligrams of caffeine, so you'd have to eat 150 grams to get an espresso kick. And as we discussed earlier, there's even less in milk chocolate. You'd need 500 grams to get a scad's worth of caffeine. Having said all that, those are averages. And given how we make hot beverages in particular, mixing grounds, leaves or an instant mix with water, how long we leave the bag in or how long we let a cafetiere steep will all impact on how much caffeine ends up in your drink. Not only that, but the level of caffeine in an individual coffee bean or tea leaf is not consistent, being affected by natural growing conditions and the variety of bean. But surely it can't be that varied, right? You'd be surprised. In 2014, a group of researchers went to a variety of cafes across Glasgow in Scotland, Parma in Italy and Pamplona in Spain on four separate occasions. At each cafe they visited, they ordered an espresso and then measured the caffeine it contained. What they found was extremely interesting. Firstly, espressos in Scotland were quite inconsistent in volume. One cafe was serving tiny espressos at 50 millilitres a pop. In another, an order of an espresso would give you 52 millilitres of coffee. In Italy, there was more consistency, with an espresso being between 15 and 27 millilitres. Espressos in Spain were bigger and ranged between 50 and 83 millilitres. The levels of caffeine within these drinks were surprisingly inconsistent, both between shops and even on different visits to the same shop. In Glasgow, the mean caffeine per drink ranged from 72 milligrams all the way up to 212 milligrams, and these variations were not totally explained by the size of the drink. In Italy, the caffeine in an espresso ranged between 73 and 135 milligrams, and in Spain, between 97 and 127 milligrams. So you might think that your usual coffee will always contain the same amount of caffeine, but this is not necessarily the case. I've certainly experienced some days where no matter how much coffee I drink, it doesn't seem to have an effect, while on other days I'll feel jittery and uncomfortable after one cup, and this may well be why. What are the short-term effects? After you eat or drink a product containing caffeine, there's a bit of a delay before any onset of intoxication. Although some studies have found an impact of caffeine on reaction time tasks within minutes of consuming it. Caffeine levels will ramp up over time and by around 45 minutes after consumption, they will be at peak levels. The effect of caffeine will then usually last around three to four hours before wearing off. Caffeine is a mild stimulant and as such, it can have a small effect on a person's alertness, their concentration, wakefulness and some studies have suggested it can improve reaction times. Caffeine can also reduce feelings of drowsiness, though this may only be in individuals habituated to caffeine, bringing them out of withdrawal. And some studies have suggested it can improve concentration and accuracy in individuals who are sleep deprived, although only up to a certain point. Nothing is a substitute for adequate sleep, particularly if you need to do something like operate machinery or drive a car. Caffeine consumption seems to cause a short spike in blood pressure. This may be happening via vasoconstriction the narrowing of blood vessels. This vasoconstriction is particularly pronounced in the brain and may be why people get headaches when they stop drinking coffee after doing so regularly. Caffeine can also increase feelings of anxiety and impact on motor function. Caffeine is a fairly common supplement in sporting environments. Evidence suggests it can improve sprinting speed, cycling ability and aid with endurance activities. It's commonly known that caffeine is a diuretic a substance that will make a person urinate more. This is true, although this is not really the case in the doses that most people consume it in. As an example, an individual would need to drink two or three coffees in very quick succession, or somewhere between five and eight cups of tea, in order to experience this. And let's be honest, that amount of liquid is going to make you need the loo anyway. It's possible to consume too much caffeine, and the effects of doing so can be unpleasant. Caffeine toxicity can cause dizziness, anxiety, the shakes or a jittery feeling, and heart palpitations. At extremely high levels, caffeine can be fatal. It will be difficult to consume this amount of caffeine through drinks such as 200 cups of tea or 50 coffees. There have been a number of media articles implicating energy drinks in individual fatalities. Even with very high caffeine energy drinks, it would be exceedingly hard to drink the amount of liquid that would contain that level of caffeine. However, other medications or foods or supplements also contain caffeine, 
so it's not impossible that caffeine was implicated in these deaths. It may also be the case that the individuals had other underlying health problems that made them more vulnerable to the effects of caffeine, or potentially that other substances were involved as well. For example, mixing alcohol and energy drinks can increase the risk of harm. More recently, it's become easier to buy powdered caffeine and caffeine pills. Caffeine is also often found in pills that claim to aid dieting, such as ketone pills. It's clearly much easier to overdose on caffeine via these methods, where the caffeine can be consumed in a more concentrated form without copious amounts of liquid alongside it. Given caffeine is a mild stimulant and can reduce feelings of drowsiness, it can also cause insomnia in some people. If you drink a cup of coffee to wake yourself up at 8pm, you might still be feeling the stimulating effect at midnight. I've always had insomnia, and so I avoid caffeine after around 4pm, although I'm aware that there could well be some level of psychosomatic input here. If I'm worried I won't be able to get to sleep, or if I'm feeling overtired, my insomnia gets worse, so it's perfectly possible that if I have a late cup of tea, I'm already expecting to sleep badly, and it becomes somewhat of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Annoying. Caffeine intoxication might give you a very small increased risk of a heart attack, as is the case with a number of other stimulants. Studies have reliably shown that caffeine will increase a person's blood pressure, and this is an effect that does not seem to disappear with tolerance to caffeine. However, this is extremely unlikely unless you have other underlying health problems, and even then, it's very rare. What are the longer-term effects? Caffeine is a stimulant, and it's a stimulant that a lot of people take very regularly, possibly multiple times every day for many decades of their lives. What is it doing to us? Some observational studies have found a link between caffeine use and risk of cardiovascular disease, the narrowing or blocking of blood vessels that can lead to heart attacks, angina or stroke. However, the pattern of results found is quite unusual. Research has found that high levels of caffeine increase the risk for the disease, but not in everyone. Some studies suggest this is only in individuals under 55, some find no such effect, and others find that moderate amounts of caffeine might be protective. In 2014, a systematic review of all the studies that looked at the link between coffee and cardiovascular disease was published. The results suggested a small protective effect of three to five coffees a day, and no great increase of risk for heavier coffee consumption. More on this study later. We do know that habitual caffeine consumption can lead to caffeine withdrawal when a person stops consuming it. The symptoms of caffeine withdrawal might be familiar to anyone who's tried to cut down. They can include headaches, lethargy, an inability to concentrate, depression, irritability and aches and pains including stomach and joint pain. Sometimes it's only when you stop that you realise the effect that something is having on you. And these symptoms are fairly common. Around half of people who drink two or three coffees per day who go into withdrawal will experience headaches. If you are keen to quit caffeine, it's worth tapering down your dose if you want to avoid these symptoms. Otherwise, they should pass within a few days of stopping. Myths and misconceptions For such a commonly used substance, there's a load of myths and misconceptions about caffeine. Here are some of my favourites. There's more caffeine in tea than coffee. I think the root of this misconception is largely well understood by people now, due in no small part to the British TV programme QI, where it's been extensively debunked. It is true that by dry weight, tea leaves contain more caffeine than coffee beans, but once you've brewed your tea or percolated your coffee, and bearing in mind the large variation in caffeine levels detailed above, in the resulting drink there will be, on average, substantially more caffeine in a mug of coffee than in a mug of tea. So this is a myth. Green tea has no caffeine. This one really depends on your brewing technique. Green and black tea leaves on average contain similar amounts of caffeine, so again it comes down to personal preference. The amount of caffeine that makes it into your cuppa will be dependent on how long you steep it for, how much you stir the pot, how hot you have the water when you add it to the leaves, and such like. But green tea isn't a caffeine-free alternative to builder's tea. That's a myth. It's impossible to have too much caffeine. I heard this myth firsthand at an event encouraging women to get into cycling, spoken by a man claiming to be a sports scientist. As has been detailed extensively above, this is very much not the case. Caffeine overdose is unpleasant, it won't make riding a bike easier, quite the opposite, and too much caffeine can be fatal, particularly if consumed as a supplement rather than in a beverage, where consuming higher quantities is easier as the caffeine is far more concentrated. It's a myth. 
Caffeine doesn't have any effect unless you're already using it. This is only partly a myth. All the physiological effects of caffeine will occur whether you've used it before or not. And in fact, due to tolerance, they might even have a stronger effect in people unaccustomed to caffeine. But there's also a growing body of evidence that suggests that a lot of the seemingly cognitive enhancing effects of coffee, the improvement in alertness and concentration, maybe even reaction time, might actually be a reversal of the impairment of caffeine withdrawal. A study led by a former colleague of mine in Bristol, Professor Peter Rogers, investigated the impact of caffeine on regular users who had been asked to abstain overnight before the study, and people who rarely or never consume it. Individuals came to the lab in the morning, around 10.30am. They were given some baseline tasks to do, then given either caffeine or a placebo at around 11.15am and again at 12.45pm. The experiment involved two further testing sessions at 1.45pm and 3.30pm. Rogers and his colleagues found that of the 379 participants recruited into this fairly epic study, those who reported hardly ever or never consuming caffeine got no benefit on various cognitive tasks from consuming caffeine, while the abstinent coffee drinkers showed improvement when given caffeine compared to those who were given placebo, but only up to the level that the non-coffee drinkers were already operating at, whether they had placebo or caffeine. Further analysis of data from the same experiment found that caffeine appeared to decrease sleepiness in those who did not normally consume it, even after just one dose. However, there was no evidence that caffeine improved performance on reaction time or memory tasks for people who didn't usually consume caffeine. And conversely, for people used to higher levels of caffeine but in the placebo condition, their performance was markedly worse, particularly later in the afternoon. So this is partly true. As a minor aside, I know these results quite well, because Peter was interviewed by a German TV company about this research. As part of it, the company wanted to reenact the study so they could film it. I was a research assistant loitering around the department the day they were filming, and I got roped in to play the part of a high-caffeine consumer, beginning the day being sluggish, but after receiving my dose of caffeine, perking right up. I really tested my acting chops that day. Decaffeinated coffee and tea still contain caffeine. This isn't a myth. It's not possible to create coffee or tea that doesn't contain any caffeine. Decaf beverages are usually made by stripping the caffeine out of the tea leaves or coffee beans, and this removes most but not all of the caffeine. This is normally done with solvents such as methylene chloride or ethyl acetate, which are themselves then removed, or using carbon dioxide. There's a third possible process called the water process, or Swiss water process after the company that performs it, which uses water and a separate batch of green coffee beans with caffeine removed to draw the caffeine out of the beans. This method isn't possible for tea. It's generally the case that decaffeinated drinks contain an order of magnitude lower dose of caffeine than their caffeinated relative, at least 10 to 20 times less caffeine. Some studies where low doses of caffeine have been administered suggest that a psychoactive effect can still be felt even at these levels. So if you want to eliminate caffeine completely from your life, decaffeinated teas and coffees might need to go as well. So this is true. Does caffeine have any medical uses? As we discussed earlier, there is now some evidence that a small amount of caffeine per day could be protective against cardiovascular disease. That said, it's important to remember that this finding came from observational studies, looking at what people choose to do. It might be the case that people who drink that amount of coffee are different from people who don't, in lots of other ways. Amount of exercise, amount of alcohol, likelihood to smoke, it could be any number of things that could also impact on cardiovascular health. But there are some ways in which caffeine might be beneficial. You might notice when you take a powdered cold and flu medication, or some brands of ibuprofen or paracetamol, that these pills also contain caffeine. Usually it's around 100 milligrams, so a fairly decent whack of caffeine. Studies have found that the addition of caffeine to these pain medications can make them a small amount more effective, although the evidence isn't strong. Some researchers believe that the addition of caffeine to this medication helps prevent the caffeine withdrawal headaches that can occur if the symptoms of their cold or flu are making a person less likely to drink their usual tea or coffee. Similarly, there's some evidence that pain after an operation can be worse if a person is unable to have their regular caffeine intake, so supplements are often given alongside other pain medication in these circumstances as well. 
Caffeine citrate, a citric acid salt of caffeine, is on the World Health Organization's list of essential medicines. It's used to treat or prevent infant breathing disorders, particularly in premature babies. Caffeine has also been implicated in a number of other diseases, including Parkinson's. Findings, again observational, have suggested that consuming caffeine could be protective against Parkinson's. Interestingly, these same studies were able to compare those who consumed caffeinated versus decaffeinated coffee, and decaf didn't seem to show this protective effect. Strangely, this effect is seen only in men, not women. If caffeine can protect against Parkinson's, then it could be extremely important, as there's currently no cure for the disease. As yet, randomised controlled trials have not found anything conclusive regarding caffeine. However, in early 2018, Japanese researchers published some findings that suggest caffeine might have another use. They assessed the blood levels of caffeine in people with and without Parkinson's and found a difference between the groups, even though they had consumed the same amount of caffeine. The authors suggested that perhaps blood caffeine levels could provide an early indication of whether an individual has Parkinson's or not, a diagnostic test for the disease. It's still early days, and it's not yet clear whether blood caffeine levels are also different in other neurological conditions, or whether this could distinguish Parkinson's from these as well. And it's also not clear why this difference in blood caffeine level was seen. As is so often the case, further research is needed. What about cancer? Everything either causes or cures cancer, right? Some things even seem to do both. Well, the good news is that in 2016, the International Agency for Research on Cancer reviewed thousands of studies and concluded that there's no strong evidence that coffee increases your chance of cancer. And some studies have gone further and suggested that coffee might perhaps reduce the risk of some cancers, specifically liver cancer and womb cancer. The studies show that these types of cancer are less common in people who drink coffee. But like a number of the other studies we've discussed, they can't really tell us of anything about causation. It's also worth noticing that the IARC, mentioned above, have also concluded that very hot drinks, hotter than 65 degrees Celsius, probably cause cancer, specifically esophageal cancer. This is a potential cause for concern for people in Middle Eastern countries and South America. Mate is often consumed at this temperature. But coffee and most other teas are usually drunk when they are cooler than 65 degrees Celsius. <laughs> 